I told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply Mordecai. This is my message for this morning. Go! Gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My mates and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. You all know the story very well. The Bible says that there was a time that Israel, or the children of Israel, the Jews, were in captivity and uh, there, there was there was a moment when a single person was seeking to destroy all of them. One single person. Out of jealousy, out of hatred, out of envy, out of anger, out of a big old ego, he wanted to destroy Israel. And the Bible says that at that time Esther had risen from being just an orphan to a very prominent place. Now she had become the queen of the land. One married to the king. And so she was in a position of power, position of authority, position of influence. And so his, her cousin, sorry, her cousin who, who had taken care of her had said that since you are in a position of authority, since you are in a position of influence, why don't you use your influence to see if you can save us? And I told you that when God lifts you, okay, at any point in time, in any area of your life, when God lifts you to a position of influence, to a position of authority, okay, God expects that you will use that for the benefit of others and for the benefit of the kingdom. I thought all of you would say amen. amen. You are who you are and you have what you have only because God allowed that to be so. Amen. The Bible says that what have we that was not given to us? I want you to understand that there is nothing that you have that God did not hand over to you. It is not because of your hard work. It is not because of your own wisdom. It is not because of your beauty. It is not because you are too smart. But God Almighty, by His grace and His mercy, has determined that you will have what you have and you will stand where you stand for a purpose that is higher than you. Amen. For such a time as this. For such a time as this. For such a time as this. Open your Bible with me to 2 Kings. Let me show you something. 2 Kings. 2 Kings. Chapter number 19. Hmm. Are you there? I still hear the ruffling of pages, so let me wait. Second Kings chapter 19. And those of you that are on your electronic stuff, I told you this day, this day and age, you don't know who is playing games on their on your on your phone or who is reading the Bible. Everybody's holding their phone, okay. And they are checking stuff. Whether they are checking their email or they are checking Isaiah, you don't know. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you're going to be blessed this morning. You're going to be really blessed. Amen. Uh, I came to the tree service, and uh, even though 
Pastor Danny did not preach much. He almost again lifted my message out of my notebook, you know. And uh, if I had notes somewhere, I would have said maybe he read it. But my note, my, my note is here and there. I have no notes here. So I know he couldn't have had it because I've been spoken to him all week. Amen. Amen. I'm reading from verse number one. And so it was when King Hezekiah had it that he tore his clothes. Amen. Amen. That he tore his clothes. And that is when Sennacherib was coming against them. He okay, had threatened them. The Bible says, covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shabna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. For the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. I know this is a scripture that mothers will understand more than fathers. Hallelujah. Amen. Mothers will understand when your time is up, when you're, you, 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 I mean, you know that you are due, when, when you have dilated and it is two, and you have waited for six to eight hours and it is still two. You see, some people don't know what I'm talking about. No. But mothers understand what I am talking about. When the children have come to birth, but there is no strength. Or maybe after a long wait in labor, now you come to a point that you are fully dilated. You are, now it's 10. But then they say push. But you know what? You have struggled so much. There is absolutely no energy in the inside of you to even push. Amen. And I want, to, I, I want you to understand that to many of us, we have truly come to a position and a place where there are things within us that God has placed within us, okay, that are like children that have come to birth. But you know what? We don't have the strength to push them out. Why? Because we are lacking something that I'm going to talk to you about today. Amen. It is a day of distress. It is a day that we can count as a day that, if you like, you should sit and see the evil of it, the negative of it. Why? Because you see, something ought to be pushed out of you, but it is still in the inside of you. Why? Because you don't have the strength to push it out. Turn your Bible with me to Luke chapter 18. And verse number one. She said, go. Gather all the people and let them fast for me. Day and night for three days, let them not eat nor drink. I and my mates will fast also. Luke chapter 18 verse 1. And he spoke a parable unto them, that is Jesus, to this end, that men ought to always pray and not to faint. In some of you, your versions say, men ought to pray and not lose heart. Right? Yeah. Men ought to pray and not to faint. Jesus spoke a parable. And he said that men ought to, are you listening to me? When, 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 when you say, when Jesus says, well, sometimes you may want to, then there is a leeway around it. You got what I want to say? But he says, men ought, men must. It is of a necessity. In fact, you know what? It, 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 you, are, you are almost under obligation from God to pray. Men ought to pray and not faint or and not lose heart. Now the way Jesus put this, it, it interests me very much because, you see, 
it's as though he is contrasting prayer with fainting. It's as though he says that if you do not pray, then you will faint. If you don't pray, then you will lose heart. Men ought to pray and not faint. Pretty much he's saying you take the first option or the second option will catch up with you. Are you listening to me? Jesus spoke a parable and he said men ought to pray and not to faint. I'm coming back to Esther, don't worry. I want you to understand that if truly God has brought you to this point for such a time as this, then there is something that can help you to push what is within you out. Otherwise, you will accept the lie of the devil, which just lets you sit and wait for time to come to you, rather than, rather than you going to meet time. Uh, some people don't know, understand what I'm talking about. you get there. Men ought to pray and not to faint. Men ought to pray and not to faint. See, <laughs> I, I realize that among charismatics, in fact, among Christians in general, prayer has become like the little if you if you if you make your way there to where Jackie is standing, Miss Jackie is standing, and there is a door on the right. Or to the left of that, there is supposed to be a fire extinguisher somewhere on the left side or so. Okay? You see that fire, that little red thing? That has become prayer to a lot of us. Prayer has become like a fire extinguisher. Okay? It hangs on the wall somewhere. We know it is important, but it's like we are not using it yet. When trouble comes, when the enemy comes against us, when we see that something ter terrible is happening, and all of a sudden we remember that the fire extinguisher is there. Let's go and get it so we can use it. And so many Christians get up, and from day to day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they forget about prayer because prayer is what they do when they go to church. For many Christians, prayer is a last resort rather than the first response. Prayer is something that we just relegate to the background and we are like, oh, it's time will come. But I realize that when you when you use prayer like that, when, when that is your attitude towards prayer, then you will step into trouble before you will seek God, rather than seeking God to prevent that trouble. Because if you believe that God answers prayer, God is a prayer answering God, then you know when you talk to God, you will believe it before whatever it is could happen. I want you to understand that, you know what, there are many things that God seeks to do for us, but it will only take we going to him in prayer. Men ought to pray and not to faint. Men ought to pray and not to faint. Now let's continue that story a bit and then I'll come back to Esther. Luke chapter number 18. Saying, verse number two, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out, now look at what he said, who cry out day and night to him, do you all see that? Mm -hmm. Who cry out what? Day and night to him, shall God not avenge his elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, 
Will he really find faith in earth? Amen. Amen. Jesus said that even an unjust judge was moved by the persistence of the widow. Because the widow kept coming in, coming in and petitioning him, coming in and petitioning him. And you know what? At the point in time, he was like, uh-uh. I need to stop this thing because, you see, if I don't uh, stop to answer her, then you know what? She will keep bothering me. So I need to answer her so she will stop bothering me. And he says that even an unjust judge who did not fear God, if he could respond like that, how much more God and his children? What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying that God is prepared to step into your situation. Whether physical or spiritual, whether emotional or mental, whether you're academic or you're held, God is prepared to step into your situation. But you know what? He wants you to go to him day and night. Now, I wonder why Jesus would say day and night. Would God not, I mean, avenge his elect? Who go to him day and night? Who cry to him day and night? Do you cry to God day and night? We are in a generation where when we need something from God, we just go on our knees and say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, this so-and-so is bothering me. Please come through. That's it. We are done. It's, it's done. It's like, that's it. I pray. I pray about it. And sometimes after we are done it once, we say, oh, I prayed about it. Uh, God did not answer me. <laughs> Let me reason with you a little bit. Some of the issues that we deal with, Okay, are far beyond five minutes prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, you when you are dealing with an issue that your great grandmother bought for you, hey. or your great grandfather, because of a black covenant, and you are dealing with issues that are taking generations. Are you listening to me? And now you are sitting here praying five minutes prayer for a generational breakthrough. What, are you kidding me? Because I realize that charismatics wants 10 minutes prayer for, 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 for years of work of breakthrough. And so you know what we, we go, Father, in the name of Jesus, my, my, my family is going through this horrible time. Father, come through for me. We are done. We are done. Five minutes prayer for a mountain that is that's in front of you. Five minutes prayer. Won't God avenge you if you will go to him crying day and night? Turn your Bible with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Let me show you something. Ephesians 6. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Are you there? Ephesians 6. I'm reading from verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Everybody say, be strong. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he begins to explain how you can be strong. He continues. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Not just some, but put on the whole, the complete, the full armor of God. Okay? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Some of your versions say the schemes of the devil. It says, let me say that before I continue. If you are seated here this morning and you have any kind of belief that you can fight Okay, when the devil comes to you, that you can stand your ground, that you can go through, that you can resist him, that you can do it, okay? You can only do it if you have put on the whole armor of God. It doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what you think, if you do not put the whole armor of God, you will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I will open your eyes to see that many other things that come to us. Married folks, single folks, youth, children, many other things. But you see, we do not perceive them as the devil coming. Because they don't come 
with what? Fork, tail, and what? And horns. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That means look around you. Your fight is not against anyone you see around. Look around you, look all over the place. In case you think someone here is your enemy. We do not fight against or we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Your fight is not against your husband or your wife. Your fight is not against your mother or your father. Your fight is not against an uncle or an auntie. Your fight is not against your children, let me say it. I say that because I know some people. If it weren't for my children and how they are worrying me and the things they're taking me through, I would have gone very far in life. Uh -uh. I know, I know. I said at home and I hear it. Not that anybody tells me, I hear it. <laughs> For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not against the one that stands with you to sing in the choir. It's not against the other one that ushers with you. It's not against your deacon or elder or pastor. Or your congregant. Let me talk to the pastors also. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, spiritual hosts, hosts with an S at the end. That means those that have risen to, to make sure that it, will, it is not going to be well with you, it's not only one or two. You have no idea how many demons are on assignment against you. Now after I'm done, you go back and not pray. <laughs> you have absolutely no idea how many demonic forces are on assignment against you. How many have been sent to come and trouble you? Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Close your eyes for a moment. Close your eyes for a moment. If I were to say I'm going to slap someone right now with your eyes closed, how sure would you be that it's not you? Think about it. Close your eyes. Can you see me? Do you know where I am at the moment? I know you can hear my voice, but it's coming through the speaker, so you may not even know exactly where I am. Because I may be very close to you. So if I'm about to slap you right now, how would you know that I'm about to? Now open your eyes. How do you fight enemies you don't see? Jesus. Spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. While you are here, okay, while you are here, and, and, and all kinds of things are filling your mind and your heart, and you are going through all the emotions and, the, and all the struggles in, of life and all that, there are hosts of wickedness in heavenly places fighting against you. And so if you will use your physical strength to fight, but you are dead, you are already dead. Because why they are fighting against you from the heavenly realm? Do you know that you can meet them out there in the heavenly realm? Uh, you don't understand what I'm talking about. If you understand the spirit that resides in the inside of you and the spirit of God that works on your behalf. Our fight is not physical. So there came a time, the Bible says that Esther, when she got Mordecai's message, then she realized that uh -uh, this thing, if we think about it physically, it's not going to help us. If we just at attack this physically, it's not going to, because what were they going to do? Were they going to fight Haman? Blow to blow? Toe to toe? Were they going to stand and say, okay, if you're a man, fight like a man? <laughs> were they going to do that? Were they going to just insult Haman and just believe that it will be gone? Let me tell you this, if they had resorted to anything physical, all the Jews would have been wiped out. Esther realized that, uh-uh, 
This is a battle that is beyond the physical. Haman might be a human being, but there is a spirit that is behind him. And so let me take the fight into the spiritual. So that whatever spirit that is instigating him to come against me, I take this battle into the spiritual. And I want you to understand whether it is your money or your health or your marriage or your family or anything that concerns you. You ought to take this battle into the spiritual. For your battle is with spirit.